This is the coming revolution in higher consciousness. Listen now to Elizabeth Clare Prophet, educator, author, and authority on the most exciting story of our time, the coming revolution in higher consciousness. I think it's very important that each one of us find threads of contact with our friends, our relatives, acquaintances, people in the world that have some inkling and some sense of the truth and can be drawn in by various avenues, various trains of thought. The concept of leaving the body in this manner, of course, is the highest method. And beloved Ascended Lady Master Leto who will speak to us shortly, is the one who trains us to leave our body temples at night and to go out in service as well as to study in the retreats of the Brotherhood. She specifically gives us the exercise of meditating on the Grand Teton, an exercise that is given in the Keepers of the Flame lessons, which you can use, and it requires that you have a good photograph of the Grand Teton in your bedroom so that you can see it uh, facing you uh, as you fall asleep. If you have read some of the I Am books, you will find the passages where Leto uh, teaches Rex and Nada, Bob and Pearl the art and the science of leaving the body. This is soul travel at the etheric level rather, on the, rather than on the astral plane. It is the highest level, and the reason that the ritual for transport and holy work is so extensive is that to be fully protected, we must, at the conclusion of our day, first of all, perform the ablutions of the soul purification, and secondly, reenact the ritual of forgiveness of all life, all who have harmed us, all whom we have ever harmed, calling for forgiveness for ourselves, that we obey the command of God, let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Let not the sun go down when you are at odds with anyone on earth. That's a very important ritual of prayer in the evening. Then there is the protection of Archangel Michael and his legions of light. As you purpose to go out in your etheric body, you are calling for Archangel Michael's protection. You also establish a very high attunement with the cosmic Christ through the Krishna mantra and all that you have given in this ritual, including the sealing, the binding, the call to the five Dhyani Buddhas on the five poisons. So it is all essential material for your protection because there is nothing to leaving the body on the astral plane, but the astral plane is the sewer of the planet and that is precisely where you do not want to go. And so to make it on the etheric octave, you do need the legions of Archangel Michael to escort you. Now, another way of being out of the body and being out of the body on the astral plane is through the change called death. The reason that I decided to give you some notes on this subject this evening is because I think it's very important that you understand this situation, this, the situation of discarnates on planet Earth. You understand our potential vulnerability to discarnates and what to do about it. Secondly, I was prompted by having been taken to the movie Ghost by members of my family. And <laughs> they said this was a movie that I had to see. And so I was very glad that I saw it, and I thought that it was a great conversation piece for you to have in your family and among your friends that you might be inviting to your house to give the ashram rituals with you or to study the ashram notes. This activity of the ashram rituals is something you can do without even any affiliation with this organization. All you need is the book and uh, we have provided the ritual book in your hand because with much use it's going to get worn and I thought it would be easy to have the rituals together and not wear out 
the beautiful bound leather version that we have of the ashram notes. And so have ashram notes and ashram rituals will travel. And you can simply invite people over that you know would like to give them and recite them. They are meditative. They cause you to exercise the power of the decree momentum, the exercise of visualization, of focusing, of meditation, of using your chakras. As you will see with the directions, all these things are combined. They are always a very wonderful experience, no matter which one you give. So I'd like to take up this movie, and I would like you to see it if you wish, and if you wish to take the notes that I'm giving you so that you can talk about it. It's kind of a, a conversation uh, piece that you can bring up at the dinner table and get into things that people don't ordinarily talk about and more so, people really do not have the answers to what is really going on. So this movie, Ghost, actually gives a very realistic picture of the death process and the discarnate that separates from the body uh, at that point of transition. So it's the story of a New York banker by the name of Sam Wheat, who is killed by a mugger. He hovers around his girlfriend, Molly, trying to protect her and discovers that he was really murdered. At the end of the movie, as Sam succeeds in keeping Molly safe and bringing his murderers to justice, his spirit is taken up in a swirl of twinkling lights, presumably to heaven. This movie makes certain statements about life after death that I would like to examine in greater detail. First of all, it states that after death, people are bewildered and disoriented they often stay in or near their former home. They have difficulty moving around the astral plane. All of that is correct. It's absolutely true. So the way this death takes place is that Sam is attacked and as he and Molly walk home at night after a play. As Sam fights with the man trying to protect Molly, he is shot. We see him chasing the fleeing attacker, but when he turns around to see what has happened to Molly, he realizes that his body is on the ground in Molly's arms and that she is screaming for help. Molly is shouting his name and asking him to respond, but he cannot. As Sam watches the ambulance come and take his body to the hospital, he slowly realizes that he is dead. Now there is a process whereby people go through the change called death that they do not realize that they have been severed from their body, that the crystal cord has been cut and the threefold flame burns no longer. Sometimes it takes days or weeks or extended periods of time for people to actually recognize that they have made the transition. Sam follows his body to the hospital and sits dumbfounded in a waiting room chair as Molly is told that there is no hope. This is a typical scene that you would see if you were either clairvoyant or if the Holy Spirit showed it to you of the passage of individuals from the screen of life. For the first few days after he dies, he stays in his apartment. He cannot go through doors unless people have opened them. Sam attends his own funeral. That is often the case. People do attend their own funerals. It's almost like a necessary process, of just as it's necessary for loved ones who remain uh, to recognize that there is a finality here and a parting. While he is at his own funeral, he is shocked to see a woman across the graveyard waving to him. She walks through a tombstone, and Sam realizes that she, too, is in the realm of the dead. At his apartment, Sam tries to communicate with Molly, but to no avail. He tries to touch her, but ends up walking through her. He just sits in the windowsill or in the corner like a forlorn child, unable to make himself heard. This is quite a bit like it feels to suddenly find oneself without a body on the astral plane. As you know, we do have a Friday night service that we regularly attend all over the world as Keepers of the Flame. This service was inaugurated in a dictation by the Goddess of Liberty, whose statue stands in New York Harbor, and whose retreat of the sun, the Temple of the Sun, is over Manhattan. The Goddess of Liberty founded the Order of the Golden Lily, and she said it was necessary for members of this order 
who are simply members by their own heart's response. It's not something that is written down on a list anywhere who's a member. But you are a member, ipso facto, if you participate in the Friday night services. And the purpose of these services is to make fervent calls to the ascended host for the cutting free of all souls who have passed on in that week, who belong in the octaves of light, and all souls who belong anywhere on any plane of being, that they be taken and escorted by the legions of angels, the heavenly hosts, to that level of evolution, whatever it may be, where they belong, rather than be left at the scene of an accident or hanging around in the streets and non-mobile, unable to navigate, they remain disoriented and are in a place where there is no progress made. Progress is made in, in life after death by being taken to the retreats of the Brotherhood or whatever level your karma takes you to so that you can prepare for your next incarnation. You might be shocked to hear this, but El Moria states that there are billions of discarnates on planet Earth today who are not in the, the level or the compartment where they belong. And of course, this is especially true in the large cities where there are so many people passing from the screen of life on a daily basis. So the service that we render on Friday night is like a cosmic cleanup committee. We call to Astrea to encircle all discarnate entities, take them where they should be, and I call for the mighty dragnet of the Lord, a huge net that I visualize the size of the planet that literally sweeps around the planet and collects these life streams so that they may be taken up by angels then to their appropriate place. I cannot even tell you how important this is for our own well-being because discarnates do, do tend to gather around people who have light because they have temporarily lost the source of their own light and so they seek to take it from those who have light and therefore there is a bit of enlightened self-interest in participating in the Friday night services. The movie made the point that after someone dies, if they have been a generally good person, they are taken to a place with white light and good spirits. If they have been an evil person, they are taken by dark spirits. Some people can choose to remain as discarnates on earth if they think that they have something left to do or if they are attached to their loved ones and surroundings. That is basically true. Um, of course, there is some error to it also. I'll give you the examples of what the movie gives and then I'll give you an interpretation of it. When Sam dies, he looks up at the sky and sees twinkling lights that remain suspended above him for a moment. It's, his expression is that he knows that that is where he should be going and he hears the call to come to higher octaves. But he makes a free will decision that he is not ready to leave Molly and so the lights disappear. It's like the angels bow to free will and leave you where you want to be. And I've seen that happen time and time again where angels come to take souls to higher octaves and they refuse to go. They want to be in their same old comfortable situation. After Sam succeeds in protecting Molly, he is ready to be taken where he's supposed to go. And the twinkling lights appear again for a few moments. And when they are present, Molly is able to see and hear him. He says goodbye to her and is swept up in a flash of light. Now this subject of the person being available to be communicated with during a short period after death is taken up in the book, A Dweller on Two Planets by Phylos the Tibetan. And I will be lecturing on it and it is quite a complicated subject and I would like to leave it for a thorough lecture. But that is the gist of it. There is a certain element of the ka or the at astral sheath that is active and present even in the place of the person himself so that there is communion with that ka or that sheath until there, the disintegration factor, the decay rate, eliminates it and the soul is secure in the place that is called devachan, the place of uh, working out one's desires and one's wish fulfillment between embodiments.
Sam observes another man dying in the, the emergency room with the twinkling lights hovering over him, and his spirit is taken up into them right away. Other discarnates, like a man he meets on the subway, stay near familiar places indefinitely. Not everyone can choose to stay. When Sam's murderers die, instead of twinkling lights coming to get them, howling and shrieking devils emerge from the ground and take them away unwillingly, presumably to the realms of hell. That is actually not entirely accurate. My observation is that the legions of Archangel Michael come and bind evil spirits or evil life streams and consign them to one of 33 levels in descending order that is the realm of the astral plane, which finally in the lowest level, the 33rd level being the lowest, is the realm of death and hell. And it simply gets darker and more evil uh, the farther down people are assigned. The etheric octave likewise has 33 levels in an ascending order. So the first level of the etheric octave would be like the kindergarten for souls who have done good and who deserve an opportunity to be taught the basic teachings, the basic esoteric teachings, and to learn and understand what is their true relationship to God. And then they may graduate to the second level and so forth. And the 33rd level of the etheric octave is the point where you cross over into the world of absolute spirit as opposed to matter. The etheric octave is the heaven world, but it is still in the matter universe. It's the highest vibrating level of the matter universe. I'm not saying that there are not howling and shrieking devils around that desire to take those whom they think belong to them and who are a part of them uh, into the underworld. But I do say that in answer to the calls of light bearers who know to make the call to mighty Estrella and Archangel Michael, there are many fallen ones who will roam around as evil spirits doing very deadly deeds after they pass on. I mean, they can cause fires, they can set fires, they can uh, cause deaths to happen. Uh, they are very deadly because they are operating from the level of adeptship in the black arts. And these individuals are not about to be taken by howling and shrieking uh, ghosts or demons. And therefore, it requires the greatest hierarchs of light for the binding of these black magicians. And that is something we also pursue at our Friday night services, making the calls for the binding of the fallen ones who are on the astral plane or may have passed from the screen of life who are antichrists and who really desire nothing but ill will against humanity. So there are many, many cases, as you can understand, even as there are many life streams. Discarnate entities are commonly referred to as disembodied spirits. They are made up of the personality consciousness of those who have passed through the change called death, as that consciousness expresses through the astral, mental, or etheric bodies. When a person passes on and has not earned his ascension, which is the goal of life, he must prepare to return to embodiment again. More advanced souls are taken to the etheric retreats of the Great White Brotherhood between embodiments to learn how to further develop their existing talents and to acquire new talents for future service. All who pass on through the change called death do not reach etheric schoolrooms. Many get stuck in the astral plane where their energies remain entangled with embodied and disembodied souls who carry the lowest common denominator of human vibration. Some life streams have such a heavy karma that they reincarnate from the astral plane. They never go anywhere, they do not advance spiritually, they come back basically as they were, with the same habits, the same desires, the same momentums. So you see how important it is to pray for those who pass on in our families, that they be cut free by Archangel Michael and Mighty Estrella and taken to the highest place possible that they can be taken to, because it seems such a long and arduous task if one is going to re-embody and basically do the same thing over and over again. And the hope of progress is in the master's retreats. So knowledge of these retreats before passing on, some people who've had this teaching for 5, 10, 20, 40, 50 years, 
and have been doing their meditations nightly and practicing leaving the body and going to the retreats of the Great White Brotherhood, they pass on and their souls fly like doves uh, to the highest octaves. So you can see the difference and you can see with a profound compassion how this teaching needs to be spread so that we can help people and prepare them. Uh, there is the Tibetan Book of the Dead that prepares individuals and souls to go on. There are prayers that are read to the dead for consecutive days, guiding the one who has left his body and actually preaching to him not to fall into dark vibrations. So we know that one thing is sure for all of us, and it's not taxes alone. It's uh, death itself, and uh, that transition can be made in the highest light entering the resurrection, or it can be a very unpleasant experience. Those who are overly attached to earthly things, such as family, position, unfulfilled desires and ambitions, or personal involvements, they are so much a part of the world that when they pass on, their spirits are not free to rise into the many mansions in the etheric realm that God has prepared for those who love him. Another situation you have with the ritual of the burial of the body is that the light remains in the body. The soul tends to be attached to the body. And then you have loved ones remaining who hold on to the person, continue to look for them, to want to see them, to want to hear them. They go to spiritualistic seances uh, to receive messages. And so they exercise, they exert such a strong pull upon the life stream that he can scarcely get free. The Ascended Master way and the way it was done on Atlantis was cremation, and it is cremation today. And all keepers of the flame are receive the suggestion, if it is their wish, to make certain that in their will there is the statement that they are to be cremated so that well-meaning family members do not uh, change that situation after the fact and therefore uh, bury the body and cause a prolongation of the disintegration of the body, the cells, and hence the light that is in the body and the cells. So I think that cremation by fire is the way that the soul most easily gets free from the emotional attachments to the body. And it also helps the family who remain to get over that attachment and to contemplate the soul in light and in higher octaves. Of course, I think you know that the ritual of burial is tied to the doctrine that uh, when Jesus Christ comes in his second coming, he shall raise all from the dead and their bodies will rise, and they will join him in the resurrection physically. We do not subscribe to that belief in any way, shape, or form. Uh, but those who do would find it absolutely catastrophic uh, to know that a loved one's body has been cremated. And therefore, we see that the process of burial goes on. On the ancient altar of, of Atlantis, there was the Maxin light. It had been placed there by the great avatar, Jesus, many thousands of years before. And whenever someone died, their body was placed into that flame, and it, it immediately dissolved. And that was one of the temple rituals that was performed. That also is described in A Dweller on Two Planets by Phylos. Uh, it's a very interesting study because it shows how ancient is the rite of sacred fire as the repository for matter, physical substance, that is tired energy. It is tired material. And it needs to pass through the flame, recycle back to the great central sun, be repolarized and recharged, and used again in creation. That, of course, is why we pass through the change called death, because the bodies we wear have become used and they have become tired, and it is time for all of their atoms to recycle in the great central sun. I personally believe that in the days of plague, of cancer and AIDS and so forth, that it is uh, not wise to bury bodies, the bodies of the sick. I believe that there is possibility of contamination through underground streams, rainfall, uh, groundwater, and uh, that these are deadly diseases that, who knows, can be transmitted in that way.
the ritual that is performed by a minister of our church at the time of the passing of an individual is to stand at the head and the feet of the body and to call for the demagnetization of the body of all light, that the light be taken up and be sealed in the etheric body, all light that has been contained in that body form. And those are prayers and calls that we make to the angels before the body is placed in the crematorium in its, its proper place for that ritual. If any of you desire to have such a service recited for a loved one, you need only call our headquarters and we will see to it, even if the person is to be buried or cremated anywhere else on the planet. The astral plane is the immediate layer of consciousness above the physical world. The four planes of matter are physical, astral, mental, and etheric. The astral plane is the repository of the collective thought and feeling patterns, conscious and unconscious, of mankind. The purpose of this frequency is for the amplification of the pure thoughts and feelings of God in man. It has instead become polluted with the impure records of the race memory. Souls who lack the necessary spiritual momentum to rise to the etheric octave hover around all the old familiar places, unable for the most part to communicate with those they have left behind. This is extremely frustrating to disembodied spirits, especially when they are unaware that they are dead. They are fully conscious of the physical world around them, yet they can move among the living. But they are unnoticed and almost totally ignored except when they can influence embodied individuals indirectly by tying in to their feeling worlds. Contrary to what spiritualists believe, discarnate entities as a rule cannot assist embodied souls in finding their freedom. They themselves are not free, and therefore they cannot give true soul freedom to others. If they had spiritual attainment, they would not be hovering near the earth. But some discarnates who speak through channels do have attainment on the left-handed path of the black arts. And many of them come to lead people astray by presenting 90% truth or 80% truth, and then because it is so plainly true, people tend to accept the 20, 30, or 40% of error that comes into their expressions. It is quite dangerous to allow oneself to take directions from a discarnate entity, even if they claim to be an advanced soul from Atlantis or from ancient Tibet or wherever, and they have come uh, to deliver their messages to a select group of people on the planet. So this is the difference between channeling and receiving messages from disembodied spirits who have hung around and taking a dictation through the Holy Spirit from the Ascended Masters who are God-free beings. I do not consider that I have psychic powers or even clairvoyance. I consider that what I have is the mantle of the messenger and that my dictations are taken through the agency of the Holy Spirit. The mantle is a grid of light that is around me to protect me from receiving teachings or dictations from any but the ascended hosts of light. In fact, it is not lawful. It is against the rules of my messengership as given to me by the ascended masters to in any way uh, be talking to or receiving messages from discarnates. I want you to know that in the process of cremation, the fire itself not only dissolves the physical form, but also erases from the four lower bodies many harmful records. The physical fire can affect the finer bodies and eliminate some very burdensome uh, material in terms of records and traumas and such things that have occurred. One of the things that I do as part of the service on Friday nights is to make calls for the souls who have passed in our organization during that week. I have made up a form so that when we receive a phone call from a loved one, I have all the data on that person, 
what caused their death, what town they died in, how old they were, and then I pull the file of that person, look at their correspondence, and see their past involvement in the organization, and get a very clear picture of that individual. We usually do have pictures of people because they get them taken when they come to conferences. So I can look right at the person, and then at my altar, I make calls. I've observed every kind of amazing condition with individuals who have passed through the screen of life, and I'd like to give you a few examples of these. Some souls are taken directly to octaves of light by angels before I even make the call. They have such a momentum in their decrees and in their service and their love of God that they have simply gravitated to that plane that they are already native to. But others, who may have been keepers of the flame only a short time or may have an extraordinary degree of karma, are trapped. They don't have enough attainment to make it to octaves of light on their own, and they actually wait until someone in embodiment makes the calls to the angels to go and rescue them. This is the true concept uh, that we find in Catholicism of praying for the dead, and that is what the wake is intended for, prayers for the departed one, that he be received by the Blessed Mother and taken to higher realms. I have found that some souls go willingly with the angels when they arrive, and others prefer to remain behind in familiar surroundings. Sometimes I project my presence to that individual and make a very strong command for the soul to receive the angels of light, for the soul to accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, and to bend the knee before the living God. When I give that command, many are totally obedient and do it, and welcome the angels and are received, and they go on. In cases where individuals have devoted their life to evil, they continue to work harm while on the astral plane, and they are forcibly bound and taken by angels so that they cannot work further harm. I have seen that in individuals, and it is astounding to me what harmful work these discarnates can do during the brief, brief period that they are loose before they are bound by the angels and taken out of the way of being able to commit any harm at all. And I, I have seen some, some just horrendous things happen through such life streams, and that is why I counsel all Keepers of the Flame and my staff to give a daily round of calls to Astraea. It is 1014 in the decree book, and you have it in the Heart, Head, and Hand booklet. The Circle and Sword of Blue Flame, given daily, give it three times, nine times, multiples of three or nine. Uh, we give them 36 times daily, have done so since the founding of our organization. It's a daily ritual that is done in the evening before retiring. It keeps people absolutely clear and free of discarnate entities as well as entities of their own habit patterns. We all have various momentums, and there are always entities around to tie into those and attach themselves to us. I consider the call to the Starry Mother to Astraea as the greatest asset to the light bearer who wishes to guard his light and be free from the imposition of those on the left-handed path that are out of the body. I'd like to give you the example of a young man who'd been a keeper of the flame for about three years. He was from South America. He had quit using marijuana and cocaine before he attended Summit University. He returned to South America and passed on, in 1988, of a cocaine overdose. The overdose may have been an accident, or it may have been given to him by someone who intended to kill him. He was robbed after he died. As soon as I heard about his passing, and sometimes I don't get word because the family is not connected with the church, and word reaches me sometimes weeks and months after the passing of an individual. When I found out about it, I called to Archangel Michael and the Blue Lightning Angels to go and find him on the astral plane and to take him where he belonged. I call for the all-seeing eye of God to place a ray of light on him so that he could be found. The astral plane is simply unfathomable depths of darkness. It is not easy to find people, to find missing persons on the astral plane. 
My call is always that the angels will take the person to the proper place of learning and preparation. Well, he was found sitting in a bar on the astral plane. He had been partying since he died. When the blue lightning angel approached him, he realized that he was dead. This is months after he passed on. He became hysterical. How did he recognize the blue lightning angel? Because he'd been in our activity for three years and made calls to Archangel Michael. That is more than I can say for some discarnates. They don't even recognize an angel when they see one. So the angel, mighty in the Lord and powerful, took this beloved soul, put him to sleep, and set him in a place, a retreat for those who need a rest and a reintegration with their four lower bodies, and who need to be disassociated from the event of their passing so that they can go on with their evolution. They need rest, and they have a type of rest, even though it's not in the physical body. So they may be resting there for days, hours, weeks, months, or years, depending on the healing process that needs to go on. And so that is my last contact with this person. He was taken where he needed to be, and it was a forward move for him to, to realize that he was not among the living, but among the dead, to go through the process of the shock, and then to be put in a place of the healing of his inner self. The next example was the case of a teenage boy who was killed in a car accident. He was the son of a church member, but not a member of our church, but very familiar with the teachings. At the time, I made the calls for him specifically on taking up of his soul. It was several weeks after the car accident. Now, various individuals had made calls on his behalf and prayers were given. But for whatever reason, he was still at the scene of the accident. He could not move, he could not get away, and whatever the great law dictated, I don't know, but he could not be taken until the time came when I made the calls. When the angels came to him, he stood up and he recognized them because of his knowledge of the teachings. He asked them to take him where he was supposed to go. And they took him to a special retreat in the Rocky Mountains in Colorado, over the state of Colorado. This is a retreat that I had not known even existed before I made this call. It is a fairly new retreat, uh, a part of an ancient retreat, but a new, uh, an entirely new wing, shall we say, of the retreat that is specifically dedicated to teenagers who have died violent deaths or drug-related deaths. There he joined other teenagers for rehabilitation. Inhabitants of this retreat are assisted in adapting to the shocking experience of suddenly being out of their bodies. Now you can know, all of you who are here, that when you hear of teenagers that pass on for these reasons, or even uh, those a little older passing on from AIDS, that there is a place where these people can go and that it is very important that you make fervent calls to Archangel Michael. Do so in a novena. You can do a novena to Mother Mary. That is a nine-day ritual of prayers where each day you come back daily, light a candle, and say the calls to Archangel Michael or Estrella for that one to be taken to that level. Another example of calls that I have made was for a single woman who lived alone, was in her late 30s. She was a photographer and had been a keeper of the flame for about 10 months. She was shot in her apartment. There was no robbery or sexual abuse, and the motive was unknown. When I made calls for her, she was on the astral plane in the city where she'd lived. She was attempting to make her way to the teaching center in that city, but she was roughing it in the astral plane. She was actually holding on to a railing to keep herself from being swept away by the tides of the astral plane. I called to the angels and blue lightning angels and seraphim cut her free. She cried in relief when she saw them coming to rescue her, and she was taken to octaves of light. 
The situation in this case was a karmic one. It occurred while El Moria was benched and his hands were tied to intercede on behalf of his chilas because of an excessive weight of karma that he had had to bear by the actions of his chilas around the world. He said that had he not been benched, he could have interceded and between her and the bullet. But this was her karma and he was not allowed by co cosmic law and by the lords of karma do that to, in that period to perform that intercession. Hearing that, we can all become very responsible, more responsible chilas than ever before in the understanding that as we are true to the master and do not take for granted his con consistent intercession for us, as we realize he is the sponsor of this community, this organization, and of the pearls of wisdom and all the activities we do, that he puts himself in a Guru Chila relationship to us, and that when we take his light and misuse it, he has to pay the price. All light is paid for in this universe. If we use it wisely and well, it is multiplied, it returns to us, and it returns to our Guru. And in that way, we multiply our talents. And that is why Jesus told the parable of the talents. And he rebuked the, the servant who went and buried his, his talent in a napkin. And he said, you should have invested it and gotten usury for your money and paid me back the increase. So that is what the guru expects, that when we receive light from the guru, we put that light to good use and we therefore contribute to his momentum whereby he can continue to assist others. So when we don't, when we ask for light, we receive it, we squander that light, we waste it. As the, the uh, Bible says, we squander it on our lusts for the things of this world. Then when we go to ask again, we will receive not. So compounding this by many thousands of chilas who get careless with their familiarity with a beloved guru, we can see that this wound up in El Moria being benched a few years ago. And we could see in things that happened around the world, as well as to Keepers of the Flame, that it was a decided disadvantage to have El Moria benched. And so we worked very hard with many decrees to give Moria a great deal of light. And he was unbenched and therefore could intercede for us again. The concept of intercession comes to us through the teachings of Jesus Christ as he has borne and does bear our karma. Other ascended masters may do the same, and if they take you on as a chila, you will be mightily blessed. But it is, as Moria says, a pay-as-you-go process in these days. What the guru does for the chila, however, is to intercede in those moments when a heavy karma could cause a major calamity in a chila's life. And because the master is grateful for the chila's service and for his upholding of the light, he will come between the chila and his karma. And because he does so, many of us never realize what we have escaped and what has not befallen us because of El Moria's loving intercession. The next case is a person, a woman who was a keeper of the flame for four years who was a hemophiliac, and she died of AIDS received from a blood transfusion. She was on in years, and when I made calls for her, I discovered that she was already on a certain level of the etheric plane. She was in the body of a little child, and she was running through meadows of grasses and flowers, enjoying herself. This type of activity where we can experience the childhood of our souls again is a healing process and a transition period preparing the soul to re-embody and to be delivered of the scars of such a death. She had balanced 23% of her karma. She had karma which could only be paid off through her passing in this manner. So the very nature of her passing was just according to the law of karma because she paid off a, a heavy weight of karma and record. She will be given the opportunity to re-embody and to continue working toward her ascension. She was a very sweet soul. She sent me her picture and told me that she was dying of AIDS. And I kept the vigil with her as this process came about. 
Another person, at the age of 60, a woman passed on. She had attended seven conferences and seminars, was a keeper of the flame for four years. When I made calls for her, I found her stuck in the astral plane. She was surrounded by sympathy, self-pity, and therefore tied to discarnates of the same vibration. She was sitting with a group of gossiping ladies. When I observed this, I once again projected my presence to her, and I said, I am here, and you must listen to me, and you must go with the angels who have come to take you. And she looked at me and the angels and said, why are you here? She remembered and said, oh, I know why you're here. I have to go with you. She turned to the other ladies and said, I have to leave now. I'm going to a better place. Now these two ladies who were discarnates of a much lower order and were in the astral plane for their own karma, they said to her, uh-huh, we'll see about that. You won't be happy there. They were trying to talk her out of going to the higher octaves. And this is what happens when people get stuck in the astral plane. There's a tremendous pull by other discarnates to keep you there. She went to the etheric octaves with the angels, and she will have to work very hard at inner levels. But she has a good start on coming back in her next life and making progress on the path. When you make contact with the Great White Brotherhood, if this happens to be the first lecture you've attended, you have made contact. The thread of contact is established. If you pursue the teachings with diligence and your decrees, that thread of contact gets stronger and stronger until it's a veritable rope. And then it becomes like a steel cable. And you never let go of the ascended masters and the heavenly hosts, lifetime after lifetime, until you make it. And so it is very important to nourish the flame of that contact and to hold on to it, because there are times in one's experience and one of those times is passing from this octave and from this body. There are times when that contact with the Great White Brotherhood is your life preserver, your lifesaver, and the most important thing you have. As you know, from dust to dust, naked I came into the world, naked I depart. We take nothing with us but our light and our attainment and the deathless solar body that we have woven. Your Keepers of the Flame lessons tell you about the weaving of the deathless solar body that you need to enter higher octaves. It's called the wedding garment in the Bible. But you have to remember that there are some things that are of ultimate importance in your life, and all of the passing fancies of life, all of the possessions that we can fascinate ourselves with, all of the new this and the new that, it doesn't go with you. Everybody else gets their mitts on it, and you go naked <laughs> as a soul back to the Lord. And at that moment, the most priceless possession you have is the thread of contact with those elder brothers and sisters who can assist you in your journey. There was a communicant of the church, had been a member for 14 years. She died of cancer at 65. She was already in the octaves of light when I made calls for her. She was attending classes in the etheric octaves to prepare for re-embodiment. She didn't have too much momentum on decreeing in all those years, and, but she passed on with 35% of her karma balanced. The last time I saw her, she looked well, but she told me she wasn't long for this world and that she had karma and she would be returning and she hoped to be re-embodying at the retreat in Montana. So those are a few examples so that you can see and understand that life definitely goes on and for a time it's very inconvenient and hazardous to be without a physical body. Some discarnates are capable of moving physical objects. That's another thesis of the movie Ghost. When Sam is following his murderer, he encounters a tall, frightening discarnate on a subway car. The discarnate picks him up and throws him out of the car, telling him not to come into his territory again. 
So this establishes the idea of a hierarchy of territory and a hierarchy of discarnates who take over certain spaces and don't want any other discarnates in their space. To frighten Sam, the spirit smashes one of the subway windows. He has mastered the technique of doing things with physical objects. Later in the movie, Sam seeks out the subway discarnate and demands that he teach him how to move objects around. As Sam is trying to move things with his supposed body, this discarnate tells him, you don't have a body now. You can't do it with your body. So everything has to come from up here. It has to come from your mind. And he teaches Sam to use strong emotions, his love, his hate, his anger, to move objects. Then he tells him it has to come from your gut. And your gut is your solar plexus chakra and your seat of the soul chakra. And so Sam makes this tremendous effort to focus all of the energy that he has in those chakras. And he succeeds in learning how to move objects in that way. He, he moves papers and pennies. He learns to turn the stove off, to close doors, and type on computers. And he even punches his murderer in order to protect Molly. There are other examples of psychic phenomenon that have been traced to discarnates. The poltergeist, which means noisy ghost. And you've all heard the spooky stories about chairs rocking and uh, things happening in houses. And there's this house on Long Island that's been the subject of a lot of articles in recent years. And uh, that is the nature of discarnates that hang around. And for whatever attainment they had or got, they are able to move physical objects. They are not invincible. They are not invulnerable. And if you just make the call to Archangel Michael and Mighty Estrella, you can clear the place of them. Then there's Upport, the sudden appearance of a material object at a seance without any apparent physical means. There are voices speaking, and there are materialization of spirits. All these things are part of the spiritualist world, and uh, my advice to you is not to enter into it, not to be fascinated with it, not to be fascinated with death, or with any of the things I've said, but to do your estrellas, to do your calls to Archangel Michael, to cut yourself free, and to know that none of these things need to be a part of you or your life or your household. When you have any sense of suspicion of it, you need to go to work with your decrees and call to Archangel Michael to come, clear your house, clear your office, clear whatever room you're staying in. Wherever I go, I call for the clearing of the discarnates out of the room. Uh, if I'm going to hold a lecture, I'll come in ahead of time and make those calls. Uh, I can tell you that fresh paint, because of the chemicals in it, um, is something that gets rid of discarnates. Uh, don't tell me how, but I know it, and the masters told me it is a certain vibration of fresh paint that definitely gets rid of old records. And that's why people like to paint and spruce up their houses and make them new and scrub and clean, because all those processes get rid of entities who live off of decaying substance. They, they propagate themselves out of decay, decaying garbage, decaying flowers. Anything that's in a process of disintegration, the atoms disassociating themselves, lets off energy. So along come the en entities to to take it up. So you never want to leave anything like that around. Don't keep things you don't need. One thing that always focuses entities is these uh, old-fashioned doll collections, where people collect dolls from 50, 60 years ago, two centuries ago. And they have all these dolls sitting in their house. And you go into a house like that, and there's an entity looking through every doll at you. <laughs> and I cannot understand why people insist upon collecting these things, but they do. So uh, you have free will. If you want to keep your dolls, keep, you'll be keeping your entities, too. Another statement that the movie makes is that discarnates crave the sensual pleasures they had while they were in human form. This is absolutely true, and that is a story to be told. When Sam is getting his lesson from the subway discarnate, 
He, the discarnate, knocks out the window in a cigarette vending machine. Looking at all the packs of cigarettes on the ground, he says, oh, what I would give for a drag. And he fondles these packages of cigarettes. So this brings up the subject of discarnates attaching themselves to humans in order to experience life vic vicariously. The law of attraction, which states that like attracts like, governs the movement of entities. Discarnate entities gravitate toward energy pools of a similar vibration. Just think about it. Entities of self-pity gravitate toward people who have self-pity. And any, any human vibration you want to name, whatever a person might be in that vibration, they will attract that entity. If you have the joy of the Lord and light around you, you will not attract entities, you will attract angels and higher beings. So that attraction is a serious matter, and that's what you have to be careful of. Entities move compulsively, merging with other misqualified bodies that roam the astral world until they find shelter in the auras of like-minded individuals in embodiment. Most people who do not decree at all have some kind of entity around them that, it is, that is very similar to themselves so that they cannot even tell that there's an entity around them because there's such a sympathetic vibration that they assume uh, that their thoughts are their own, their feelings are their own, and in part, their thoughts and feelings may be reflecting a discarnate entity that is very much like them. Therefore, El Moria teaches that few among mankind are free from the influence of discarnate entities. Now, when you enter the path of light, and you want to be a chila of the ascended masters, and you're going to accelerate and you're going to move forward, then the discarnate entities that have been around, perhaps they've been around you for lifetimes, feel threatened, and they try to remove you from that path and get you to not do your decrees, stay away from services, and get farther and farther away from that thread of contact that you've established. This is why it's important for Keepers of the Flame to pray for those who are entering the path. So entities who are used to sapping your light from you are not going to take kindly to those individuals who introduce you to a path where you can be totally entity free for the rest of your life. And that is this path of the Great White Brotherhood and the science of the spoken word. Those addicted to alcohol, tobacco, drugs, and excessive sugar are examples. They're examples of astral entities affinitizing with those on the physical plane who have similar habit patterns to their own. Bars and hangouts of drug users are literally packed with discarnates who attach themselves to those who are taking in these stimulants. Sometimes there are as many as 50 to 100 entities attached like leeches to one individual who is smoking or taking drugs. And by attaching themselves to that person's emotional body and their central nervous system, they can experience smoking that cigarette, taking that drink of alcohol, taking that shot of cocaine or whatever. Entities crave the sensual pleasures to which they were addicted before losing their physical bodies. They often tie into the back of the neck or the spinal column where the most energy can be gotten. S by so doing, they vicariously enjoy the pleasures to which they are accustomed. This transfer takes place as the result of the merging of the astral bodies of the discarnates with the astral and physical bodies of the incarnate individual through the sympathetic nervous system. The desire of an individual for a drink for alcohol is therefore multiplied as much as a thousand times by the desires of the entities. I now have given you the definition of addiction. The reason why people find it impossible to stop smoking, stop drinking, stop the sugar habit, stop the drug habit, 
and even when they know they may die of AIDS, of being completely careless and carefree in their sexual habits, contracting AIDS, etc., is because these demons and discarnates tie into them and urge them and goad them to engage in their old addictions and habits. This is why when you are praying for someone, you need to call to Archangel Michael to bind all demons and discarnates who actually become possessing entities. They possess the individual, they take over his life. He cannot exist unless he goes out and has a smoke every two hours. Impossible, he cannot exist. He wants to stop, but he can't stop. When you come to the feet of the Ascended Masters and you call for their help and their intercession and you give your estrellas and you make your determination, you'll be surprised what miracles will happen to you, how you can be immediately free of these harmful substances because the legions of light take from you all those entities. Free of those entities, all you have left to deal with is your own desire. And you can work on that with your decrees and your determination. Another thesis of the movie is that discarnates can talk to and sometimes use the bodies of spiritualist mediums or psychics. Discarnates can be obnoxious and refuse to leave the mediums or psychics alone. That's what comes up in, in a very humorous a sequence of scenes where Sam goes to a medium in order to communicate with Molly. So it's absolutely true. Spiritualists, mediums, or psychics can definitely give messages from discarnate entities uh, to whoever wants to hear them. We don't pursue that practice, and we recommend our students do not, because it simply ties you into the astral world. It ties the soul who should be going on to another mansion in our Father's house into a sympathetic and symbiotic relationship to yourself. When people pass on, it is the will of God, or it is their own free will if they have destroyed themselves in one way or another and created their untimely death. But death is a finality, and we have to surrender our loved ones because they have places to go and work to do, and we have to continue living as hard as it is. So anyway, Sam has to solve the, the murder of himself because Molly uh, knows the murderer and does not suspect him and is friendly with him, and uh, he is concerned that, Sam is concerned that his murderer will now murder Molly. So Sam goes to a spiritualist medium, Oda Mae Brown, who is played by Whoopi Goldberg, and it's a really a very humorous scene. <laughs> he wants to get her to help him warn Molly. At first she refuses, but he keeps her awake all night singing until she finally agrees to help him. And Sam goes to her throughout the movie. At one point, he interrupts the seance, attended by about 10 discarnates. Uh, actually, she had been a fake all these years, but when Sam came along, she really started hearing uh, discarnates. <laughs> and so now she, her, her place is packed with them. And in the confusion, an impatient spirit jumps into the body of the medium and begins speaking through her. And all of a sudden, she's talking with the voice of this man. When she orders the discarnate out, he lies limply on the floor and has no energy to move. His fellow discarnates ridicule him for not knowing that entering a body drains a discarnate of energy. What the film does not bring out is that discarnates drain energy from the medium. And that is why the Brotherhood is so adamant on this question of going into seances. One explanation of the phenomena that takes place during seances is the formation of ectoplasm. Ectoplasm is described as a mysterious, usually light-colored substance that is said to exude from the body of a spiritualist medium in a trance and may then take the shape of a, a face, a hand, or a complete body. Now, as far as I'm concerned, there is no difference between a spiritualist medium and a channeler. A channeler is just, to me, a new word for the same practice. And I want you to know that I am not judgmental of either spiritualists or mediums. I know many people engaged in this service who are dedicated to it, and I love them and I bless them, but I simply say that the practice is dangerous. Ectoplasm is said to be the substance involved in the materialization of spiritual bodies. The levitation of material objects 
is commonly explained by the gradual buildup of columns of ectoplasm underneath the objects. It is said that the force exerted by ectoplasm is great enough to raise a table completely off the ground with a man's weight on that table. It is generally thought at the, that the, at the end of a seance, the ectoplasm disappears and returns to the medium. This, however, is not true. This is where the fallacy lies, and this is where the danger is. The vital energies that are taken by the spirits from those who participate in spiritualistic activities, whether as a medium or an observer, are never replaced. Those energies are immediately used to produce psychic phenomena and to sustain their existence. To those who consciously practice necromancy, that is, communion with the dead, or hold consort with the spirits of the departed over a considerable period of time, there is a gradual drain of vital spiritual energies and a deterioration of the physical body and the brain. Each person has a certain allotment of the life force that is apportioned to him at the beginning of his embodiment. Prolonged involvement in trance work, psychic phenomena, and spiritualistic activities can result in a critical drain upon that allotment. Now that energy of light that surrounds the body and that is in the body, you are intended to use to weave your wedding garment, your deathless solar body. It's the vehicle of light that you require to enter the higher etheric octaves at your transition. The reduction of the life force through psychic activity can cause a person to forfeit his ascension in that embodiment. I know of a case of two very devout souls, a husband and wife, who were the sweetest people that you would ever want to meet, and yet they lacked this energy that is natural to the aura of those on the path. It is a certain layer of light. So I asked Mark Prophet, this is before he passed on, I asked him what was the nature of the problem with these individuals. And he said that they had been psychics and they were involved in spiritualism in past lives in Holland and it would take them four or five lifetimes before they regained that light that they had squandered in that activity. They were very devoted keepers. They worked hard. Uh, one of them has passed on at this point, and I trust that they have made great progress on the path. So that was an amazing example because you could see that something was missing from these souls, even though they were lovely people. For this reason, the masters have cautioned their students against the extreme dangers of taking dictations from or channeling astral entities purporting to be masters, adepts, or ascended masters. Discarnates who profess to be masters of the psychic realm are the most dangerous of all. They not only drain the vital energies of their auditors, but they release confusing information and half-truths. And so there is a big difference between mediumship and messengership. And I think I have made that clear. Messengers do not, as a rule, give what are known as life readings, except it be directed by the Ascended Master who is sponsoring an individual life stream, and that individual will learn from understanding his past momentums of good and of attainment, as well as his past mistakes. What is dangerous is partial life readings taken from the astral level by psychics for want of any other word. I don't use psychic as a pejorative. It's someone who has awakened and quickened soul senses. But if the soul is awakened, the soul must rise and become one with her Christ self. So I have seen more people who have had life readings, who have come to me with a great burden that they were this or that or the next person or did this in a past life. And in order to clarify their path and assist them, I have gone to Elmoria to ask him whether or not they were thus and so in their past life. Many times they were never that person at all, but since they visited someone who did a regression, they have believed it ever since and gone around with a burden that wasn't even theirs to carry or with illusions of grandeur that are totally ridiculous. So I tell you, until God, the Holy Spirit, and an ascended master reveals to you a past life, because the time has come for you to deal with that karma, leave it alone. 
Just go ahead and do your violet flame and transmute the record, study your psychology, and don't be curious about it. You are who you are, which is the sum total of all your past lives today, and it's not necessary to dissect previous embodiments until it becomes a point of initiation from a master. The worst part of it is if that when it is a real past life and the individual is totally unequipped to deal with some horrendous circumstance, it's not time for this to be opened up. They are not ready for it. And so it's like forcing a flower. It's, it's very unhealthy. The path of the ascended masters leads to the ascension. The path of psychic phenomena can lead to hell or the astral realm. Saint Germain once said that nothing good can come out of the psychic. The thing about astral entities is that they are tormented by their unfulfilled desires and disconnected from their God presence and Christ self and the soul. Sooner or later, they discover the means of drawing strength from those who have not lost their tie to the source. They can get your energy if you overload your body with sugar, for instance, and you get so yin that you are open and that, that energy of light is actually coming out of you and therefore can be taken by entities. This is why entities like to get people addicted to sugar. And the problem we have in the United States today that cereals, foods of every kind, have sugar added to them. You need to read the labels on all of the food that you buy and recognize that sugar comes in many guises, lactose, fructose, corn syrup, molasses, there's a whole list of things you'll find in products and the word isn't sugar that is used for them. And so you need to be aware that it is deadly and it does weaken you and it does make you susceptible to the astral plane and to entities. And that is why sugar is an addiction. And that's why you have to make calls to be cut free from it. There are two ways that entities derive their energy. First, through the conscious, willing cooperation of people on Earth, specifically when individuals gather in a seance and invite the spirits to commune with them. In this case, the vital energies flow to the disembodied one over the thread of contact established by the attention of those in the circle. It is cosmic law that wherever you place your attention, there your energy goes. I used to know this very sweet little lady who was in Illinois. And she had been in this activity many, many years in Newmark Prophet. And she was a spiritualist medium. And I can remember when we visited her in her home in Illinois. And she dedicated her life to receiving messages to entities and had her circle of people who would come to her seances. And she was bound and determined that this was a lawful calling, that she was helping all these discarnates um, receive comfort, receive teaching, receive healing. It's like she held consort with them. She invited us to stay overnight in her home. Uh, we respectfully declined. <laughs> but I can remember being in that house. It was so packed with entities, it was unbelievable. Her name was Blanche, Blanche McCarl. I'll never forget it. And every number of months or so, she would call me by phone. And this lasted all the rest of her life and even after Mark's ascension. And she would tell me that she was deathly ill, very sick, would I please make calls for her? Well, I knew exactly what was happening. So I would go to work and make the calls to clear all the entities out of her house, get them all pulled off of her body. And she'd call me and say she was feeling fine and she'd last for another three months or four months of seances and call me up again <laughs> and make the calls all over again for her. But bless her heart, she, she believed to her dying day that she was rendering a tremendous service to all these discarnates when really what she was doing is keeping them earthbound, keeping them tied to herself. It's almost a point of ego when you come right down to it. Second, entities receive energy whenever individuals are inharmonious or out of tune with their higher self. Vibrations of irritation, grief, fear, anger, disdain, fatigue, and of other negative thoughts and feelings, even the dissonance of rock and, rock and roll rhythms, puncture the natural protective envelope that surrounds and interpenetrates the four lower bodies of man. 
This natural envelope holds the spiritual energies that are released to man from his own God presence. Discord of any kind in one's world automatically rends or tears your spiritual garment. Without the wholeness of this spiritual protection, man's energies become subject to the vampire activities of astral entities. That is why the first thing you learn in your first Keeper of the Flame lesson is how to invoke your tube of light. You put it on in the morning, you reinforce it through the day, you give that tube of light call with tremendous fervor and intensity, call to Archangel Michael, call for the violet flame, keep yourself protected, and if you are in harmonious, call on the law of forgiveness, reestablish your harmony, reestablish your tube of light. If these forces can create in your life circumstances that are calculated to disturb you until you lose your balance and become discordant, the discarnates can then steal your light. And that is why the law goes forth, which I stated in my previous lectures this weekend, that God will not give to you any more light than you can keep in harmony. If you can keep your harmony, then you can increase your light, because God knows if you are incapable of keeping your harmony, then every time you get light, along comes invisible forces and creates a problem in your world, and you get all upset, and out goes a light, and you are depleted, and they have it all. And that's a failed test, it's a failed initiation, and you have to pay the price for that light that you allowed these robbers to take from you. So that is why you need the reinforcement of the tube of light. That is why you need the violet flame, because you cannot be harmonious by your human will. You need the Christ presence and the, the angels and the masters with you. You need your protection established. There are many things that we cannot do by willpower. We are overcome by ancient momentums of being upset and getting disturbed over things. And so seeking the higher way of oneness with the Christ, oneness with Jesus, or the ascended master of your choice is the way to begin to develop the strength to resist falling back into those patterns of becoming upset. This is why you need to get the pearls of wisdom, to be sure you don't miss those pearls, that you study them. They're your contact to my heart and to the master's heart. It's why you need your keeper of the flame lessons and to really decide that you are going to become an alert chila. You don't have to spend hours a day at it, but you have to put some time into the path if you're going to get the rewards that you deserve. Another kind of entity besides a discarnate entity is a mass entity. Mass entities are force fields of humanly misqualified energy. They are the thought and feeling creations of unascended man. These entities are the accumulation of mankind's own momentums of hatred, violence, war, greed, mayhem, murder, gossip, etc. These entities as islands of darkness float on the astral plane. They can be as large as a city and they are very deadly, and then they come upon people whose bodies and whose minds they can use to, to wreak havoc in the community. Diabolical forces direct these pockets of darkness against unsuspecting souls. Acts of crime diagnosed as temporary insanity are sometimes brought about when vortices of vicious energy are focused upon the auric fields of unsuspecting or negative individuals. These individuals are vulnerable through their re receptivity to harmful vibrations or their lack of defense against them. This is why sometimes when there are mass murders, you see a repeat of them and they come in waves and cycles and they sweep the country. Unbalanced individuals read about a mass murder in the paper. They get totally absorbed in it in a crazed way. That mass entity is, gravitates toward them by the like attracts like. And that mass of demons, it's like a swarm of bees. It's a, it's a huge energetic force field that moves toward the weakest link in the human chain and acts through that individual. Mass entities can work through madmen, through leaders, through people who, who direct all types of, of murders and atrocities on a, on a large scale. And so those mass entities are what we work on at our Friday night service as well as the discarnate services. I talked to you about Astraea's, and this is what Astraea has said in her dictation. The Lord God has given to man dominion over all things, but this dominion does not give man the freedom 
before he attains self-mastery to probe the depths of human effluvia and to become entangled in the astral world of thought and feeling. The source of all human imperfection is old astral records. Buildings and houses, people and even animals in the world of form are filled with these old records. Your tube of light must be made strong and resilient that it may bend when necessary, but never break against the onslaughts of psychic disturbances. You must learn to move in the world of form as victors over death and misqualified energy. The vortices of evil and of psychic disturbances may move all around you, but you may call upon your divine presence for release and deliverance. You may call unto me and I will assist you by locking my cosmic circle and sword of blue flame around these vicious foci and providing not only yourselves with deliverance, but also those whom you love. You must be persistent in your calls and determined in your conviction that the light of God will not fail to answer them. And you must under no condition yield an inch of ground to those forces which are not of the light. Beloved ones, these forces could not survive a single day if it were not for the feeding of mankind's energies into them. There is only one source of life, and that is God. The inhabitants of the astral world have in the main cut themselves off from the divine idea. They no longer recognize the God of the universe as their God. They seek to take the vital energies of God released to man daily and to siphon them off through his imperfect mortal consciousness by playing brother against brother, by creating situations of hatred and confusion so that people will willingly yield their energies to the wrong vibratory action. Every time you lend yourself to feelings of irritation, criticism, condemnation, and judgment, or inharmony of any kind whatsoever, you are prolonging the life of the astral entities, whereas divine harmony is of no use to them at all, and divine harmony seals you. God's energies, when retained inviolate and pure by man, can never be trampled upon by the astral creation, for they cannot enter perfection, and thus perfection is its own protection. Jesus gave the key to holiness wholeness when he said, Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Entities are unable to attach themselves to those who prize harmony above all godly virtues. If these entities can catch the children of the light off guard, they can derive more benefit from their relatively pure energies than they can from the relatively impure energies of those who move in and are saturated with the momentums of the mass consciousness. For the purer the energies, the more readily they are assimilated, in particular, the taking of drugs tears the protective envelope placed around souls at birth, leaving their users more vulnerable to the activities of discarnates. That is why those on the path have to be even more careful than others, because they want the purest light the purest essence. In order to reestablish the force field of natural spiritual protection, those who have taken drugs should, one, call on the law of forgiveness for having interfered with a natural unfoldment of the divine plan within their lives. Two, invoke the violet fire and the tube of light, calling to Archangel Michael and his legions of blue lightning to cut them free from all psychic forces that seek their destruction. Then you have to go about reweaving the garment. You have to call to Archangel Raphael and Mother Mary to bathe these souls in the healing fires of the Christ. I had a person that I knew who had crazy accidents, stupid accidents, and that, that hurt him physically. And he came to me and sincerely implored to know why he was having those accidents. So I took it to the altar. I asked El Moria. El Moria said, this person has holes in his garment. These holes are the re result of the misuse of the sacred fire and other things that the person has done in this life and previous lives. Those holes have to be mended. And the angels will take the light that you invoke, and they will weave a patch, so to speak, for the tear in the garment of your finer bodies. And so it was suggested to this individual that he conserve the sacred fire and the life force and give his decrees so that he could use that energy, the angels could use that energy to mend the rents in his garment, the tears in his garment. We see that drugs cause these holes in the 
finer bodies in the inner garments, and therefore much healing is required, and Raphael and Mother Mary will assist you and your loved ones and those for whom you pray. But it is a necessary process. Some people, by what they've done in many lifetimes, and in this one also, have enough holes in their garments that they can come into a session and receive light, and they cannot retain it. They cannot even retain it for a 12-hour period. It's like having a sieve for an aura. But this too can be healed. It can be mended. With God and with a light, all things are possible. But this is what we find when we go to help people who are newly coming on the path. Alcoholics, drug addicts, chain smokers, etc., are not the only victims of the wiles of astral entities. Entities have a trap for every type of human consciousness, even for those who call themselves the elect of God. The vibrations of spiritual pride can also attract to the aspirant the most deadly type of entities who seek nothing short of the destruction of the soul in hell. You have to realize that spiritual pride is that which is embodied by higher type discarnates on the left-handed path, black magicians and fallen ones who are very subtle and very cunning in the thoughts that they project into your mind and that you agree with because you are not yet purified from intellectual, human, spiritual, or whatever type of pride. And so in people who have none of these addictions of the lower order of things that we're speaking of, yet they are addicted to themselves and therefore they are susceptible to entities that have the same type of thought and feeling processes that they do. I want to remind you that Halloween, it's on his way, and that discarnates have a heyday on Halloween because people's attention is on the astral images, and these images are posted in every town in America, images of witches, skeletons, goblins, etc., and they're quite realistic of exactly what is on the lower astral plane. We always have a vigil in our community, 24-hour vigil during the Halloween cycle, especially against the more harmful practices that we've seen in Halloween on the past. Entities have names so that they can be named in our decrees and prayers. And that is why Jesus said, what is thy name? When he was speaking to the discarnates, the possessing demons, before he would cast them out and therefore he would name them. The list we have of discarnate entities is found in our decree book. And if you wish to use this list, I suggest you affiliate with one of our local groups and learn how to make the calls for the binding of entities using the calls to Astraea. There's a prayer in the ashram notes for souls who are taking their leave of the earth today. It's on page 63. That's in the ashram notes, not in the ashram. Yeah, in the ashram ritual book. It's in that ritual. I'm just mentioning it in case you would like to look at it. At this time, I would like to give you a very brief break so that we can have our dictation uh, immediately upon your return. Thank you very much for allowing me to give you this lecture at this late hour. I felt it was very important for your understanding, especially those who live in and around the city. We are in New York, and it does need a cleanup. Thank you very much.